for the world, including in your life, transformations taking place. And that transformation offers you a great life. And uh, I pray that God will touch your heart even today. Now, let me just tell you my objective today. I want you to know my objective. This is what I prayed for. This is what I prepare for. I come this morning to deliver the message that God's laid on my heart. But what I pray that you hear is not the message I deliver. I pray that God will personalize the message for you. I pray that when God speaks into your heart today, you will hear things in the sermon that I have no clue that you're going to hear. I pray that God will speak to you in a personal way to where God's Spirit will take and the words will become so real to you, you'll wonder, how did He know? And I don't know, but I'm trusting God to use the use of His Word. This morning I'll use a lot of Scripture, and, and uh, I pray that you have a Bible and follow along with me. But just in case you don't have one that's handy or you don't turn in it quite as quick as you'd like to, I'm going to take and put all the Scriptures that I'll use up on the screen this morning. And um, so you'll see a lot of Scripture verses just this morning. And as I read them, I want you to know where they're where they're found in the Bible. I want you to know that it's God speaking, not me. The illustrations that I use and all of that are just used to take and gather us our attention together so that God can speak into our hearts individually. Let's pray. Father, this is my desire, this is my prayer, that You, Holy Spirit, would come this morning. The unction of God, the Holy Spirit of God would come this morning. And so fill me that the words of my heart would come out and that the words from Scripture would take and be revealed this morning, that you would speak personally to each one of us. We thank you for your presence. Advance, Father, and we pray that we will be receptive to your speaking to us, and that when you say yes, we'll say yes. When you say no, we'll say no in our lives. Bless us. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to thank with you from the passage this morning found in the Bible, and it talks about the aspects of God's salvation. I want to think on the subject of God's salvation. Now, when you look at this picture, don't you get the idea that w- what is in that? The abstract art in here, you look and you, you say, well, I know what he was getting at right here. And you look at the abstract art and you begin to see different things in it. I want you to understand that when you look in the Bible at God's salvation, that's how it appears to you in the beginning. You begin to think that this is what it is all about. But the beautiful thing about God's salvation, I came to know Jesus Christ at age 12, followed Him in believer's baptism later to demonstrate what happened to me on that day when I invited Jesus into my life. But I want you to know that as I gave public testimony that day in believer's baptism of what happened to me when I was at age 12, I didn't even have a clue about all of God's salvation. It just continues to come to me. And every time I hear a sermon, whether I'm preaching it or someone else is preaching, every time I hear a sermon that is based on the Word of God and delivered using Scripture from God, God speaks to me and reveals the beautiful tapestry of salvation that He gave me when I was 12 years of age. It gives me goosebumps when I even think about it. Now, as I do that this morning, I want to take and turn in the Bible to 1 Peter and we're going to look in just a moment at First Peter. As we do, I want to think about who Peter was. Now, Peter was one of the twelve disciples. He later became one of the apostles. As God took and left the disciples, He took and when He was crucified on the cross, He was buried for three days. And after three days, He rose from the grave. And He came back and He appeared uh, as a human being, over and over and over, let them touch him, see the scars in his hands, and, and put their hand into the, the wounds in his side to show that he is the same man that was killed and dead for three days, and he's still alive, and only God could do that. And he wanted them to be convinced of that. He had told them about this before it happened, even back hundreds of years. It's recorded in the Scriptures that prophets... Preachers, pastors, if you please, back in hundreds of years before Jesus would come, told about where He would come, what city He would be born in, what would be the circumstances of His life, how He would die on the cross, and how He would raise from the grave, and how He would come back in the same body, in the same life that He had before, as a resurrected thing, and then promised to us that those of us who follow Him will be like Him. (laughs) 
<laughs> gives me goosebumps when I stop and think about it. That this is not what it's all about. Last night I woke up and my foot was hurting me. I got up this morning, I told my wife, I said, my foot hurts so bad, I think I need to go to see a doctor. And then I told her that this hurt and that hurt. And I said, take my temperature and all these kind of different things. And, you know, I said, I'm in terrible shape. I need multiple doctors to help me. She looked at me like I was some kind of nut. You know, you know, my wife's gone through pancreatic cancer for the last year and a half, and here I am talking about my toe hurts. And, uh, you know, you, sometimes we just get life all confused, don't we? But, you know, one beautiful thing about my life is that no matter whether God chose to t- chooses to take my life today and I go to be with Him in heaven, I'm not dead. I continue to live. And that's a beautiful thing about life. This morning I want to think with you about this. Who is Peter? He was a disciple. But then God chose him to be an apostle. Was an apostle. Apostle is one who is called by God. And he took and called him. And by the way, his name means rock. It means rock. It means Cephas. That is the word that he called him. And that's just a translation from one language to the other, like what it is in Spanish, what it is in French, what it is in English is different. And he called him a rock because that's what he intended for him to be. Are you a rock? Peter became an apostle. That's a person who has a commission to go and do something. And his job was to go out and to share with others and for it to be recorded in Scriptures. And therefore we come to a book which he, he with his own hand, wrote as God spoke through him. First Peter is one of those books. And he talks to us and he calls us strangers. Now he didn't call us strangers because he didn't know us. He was talking to some people he knew face to face. But He calls us strangers because we're strangers in this world. You know, God never intended for us to live our life in this world. You say, hold it now. Didn't He birth me? Didn't He put me into this world? Yeah, but He never intended you to live your life here. This is just the start. This is just the taste. Because heaven for eternity is the life that God intended for you and gave to you. When you became a Christian, you gained the entrance into heaven and you're beginning to live your life as it's going to be lived while you're still here on earth. And he claims no other title for himself. Peter didn't t- claim any other titles. He had lots of different things he could have claimed, but he wanted no other title for himself than that. And he referred to us as aliens. We don't belong here. I heard about a fellow today that, that has visited our church and he's been deported back to Mexico because he didn't come here legally. He broke the law. And you know, we're aliens. We're here for a temporary period of time, and we're going to be deported back to heaven where God created us for. You know that? And I tell you, I look forward to that day. Kind of scary that what I have to go through to get there, you understand. But the important thing is that Jesus is going to go through that with me because I gave my life to Him. In Philippians 3, we read about this. In Philippians 3, verse 20, it says, Our citizenship... Not in America, not in Mexico, not in Spain, not in France. Our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly await for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We eagerly wait for a Savior, someone who will take us by the hand. When it comes time for me to die, I will take and go from this world into the real world of heaven, nonstop, in an instant, Jesus will take me at the moment I die. He'll take me by the hand and say, Have you got a good life to live now? You just thought you had it good. Now, see what all is yours. And you know, that's a beautiful thing. And then he uses a word in here called scattered. Scattered. If you take seed and scatter it out, you'll find that later it will take and germinate and grow into a plant all over. Try that sometime. Take some flower seed. And just go out in your yard, don't get, don't get fancy, and just scatter that flower seed in your yard. In several weeks after it's rained, the sun came out, you're going to find out that they're all over the place. And that's what He did. He scattered us. You see, when Jesus took and ascended into heaven after 40 days here living after His death, He ascended into heaven. He said to the apostles, go out now and teach them. And on one occasion, the first time they preached, 3,000 people joined the church and gave testimony of Jesus coming into their life. 3,000 people. Can you imagine on Easter Sunday if we had a large crowd here and out of that large crowd, 3,000. 
thousand people joined this church, going through the waters of baptism, saying, this is what happened when I gave my life to Jesus. And 3,000 people joined the congregation. You say, we don't have room for 3,000. We would if they came. We'd have room for them if they came. But the important thing is, you have to invite them. And that's what they did. They invited them and they shared with them. Now, with that basis of 1 Peter, kind of an introduction to the book, Let's go to 1 Peter. We're going to go to verse 1. And what I want to look at is that God takes and gives us a lifeline there. When we go to the first, to 1 Peter, the first thing I see, a couple of double A's. When we go to 1 Peter, the thing that we see in 1 Peter is that we are given a lifeline. And do you know what a lifeline is? Picture in this, this picture here, picture me that you're drowning in life. No matter what your circumstances are, you're literally drowning in life. And as you take and you're drowning in life, you look up and there's somebody drops a ladder to you. As uh, I went over to Mississippi, uh, over to Louisiana uh, years ago when they had a big flood come in the ocean, the hurricane came in and flooded them. And I went over there as a chaplain to work and helping the people there. And I was especially helping those that had lost loved ones because their people had not gotten a lifeline and they had perished. And all we had was the remains of them. And people were coming and bringing toothbrushes and all kinds of different things just so that we could identify remains with their loved ones and give them a closure that they would know that, that something had been done there for them. As we think about this matter, that's exactly what a lifeline is. A lifeline is reaching out and giving it to somebody. Look at the words in, in 1 Peter with me here, the verse 12, of 1 through 12. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the temporary, remember, you're, if you've given your life to Jesus, you're just temporarily here. And temporary residents dispersed in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, and set apart by the Spirit for obedience and for sprinkling with the blood of Jesus Christ. Now I want to pause right here because there are two different camps of people that look at this, and sometimes people take things out of context. But I want to take things in context. I want you to notice that the word according does not end until we get to Jesus Christ. Sometimes people take the foreknowledge, which is another word that's used as predestination, and they take and conclude this according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, and set apart for the Spirit. They take and say that that means that people were chosen. God said, okay, you, you, y'all are going to go to heaven, and the rest of y'all are going to go to hell. That's what some people believe. It's called Calvinism or a predestination. And people believe that that means that you're going to take and go to hell, and there's no chance you can join a church, you can get baptized, you can do belly flips or whatever you want to do in church, but you're not going to go because God pre-planned before the beginning of time, all of y'all are going to hell and y'all are going to go to heaven. I want to join y'all, by the way. Now, that's what some people do because they take it out of context and only read a portion of the verse, but I want you to see the whole context. According to the foreknowledge of God, the Father set apart by the Spirit for obedience and the sprinkling with the blood of Jesus Christ. It was planned before the beginning of time that the way that we would be saved would be through the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. The predestination was not you and me. It wasn't a choosing of you and me. It was the choosing of Jesus Christ would be the answer, the solution to our salvation. Now you find that scripture only two places. People like to argue about it a lot of time. Predestination. But you only find that scripture in the scripture, in the Bible twice. It's found over in Acts 2, 23, and also here. And both times, if you read the context, you'll see that the predestination has to do with the pre-planning of Jesus Christ to be the solution. I want you to know there's no other way under heaven and earth by which man may be saved except through Jesus Christ. That's another uh, explanation of the passage. So the lifeline was thrown out to the earth. The lifeline is Jesus Christ. The lifeline is not Pearsall Road Church. The lifeline's not the, the Episcopalian church down the street. The lifeline's not the Catholic church down the street. The lifeline's not this religion or that religion. The lifeline is Jesus Christ. And He was sprinkled out. That means that He was hung on the cross and His body was taken and beaten and He bled and the blood of Jesus Christ spilled out for your salvation. What does it take for you to get it? You have to accept it. 
How do we know you accept it? You have to confess it. That unless you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you're not saved, the Bible says. And so, as we look at this passage right here, it says in, in 1 Peter 1, verse 3, he goes on to say, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why blessed be Him? Because He's the one that provided this. He is the one, according to His great mercy, He has given us a new birth and a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You can have that knowledge that you're going to heaven by believing Jesus Christ, believing what He did for you, and believing that you, and you, then you accept it. And how do we know you accept it? You publicly testify of that. You literally testify what you believe and stand in. If a, if five armed people came in here this morning wearing masks on their face, and they came in here with rifles and all looked at us and we couldn't escape, what would we do? Well, we'd sit there scared to death. And then what if they said to us, those of you who really are not Christians, those of you who do not really believe in Jesus Christ for your salvation, you can leave right now and not be shot. But all of you who testify that you are Christian, you're going to heaven, I want you to stay in here because I'm going to send you to heaven in just a few minutes. We're going to kill all the Christians that remain. How many of you would get up and leave? It's estimated that over two-thirds of the people that sit in the church that call themselves Christians would get up and leave. They'd say, i got to leave. I'm pregnant. i I, I got to protect the baby. I, I, I've got children. I've got to protect my children. I, I, I've got you know, all these different excuses. God knows that I'm a Christian. But the truth of the matter is you would testify against Jesus Christ. You would testify against Jesus Christ. A lifeline is given. The lifeline is Jesus Christ. We need to invite Him into our hearts. Then we need to publicly tell people Jesus is the only reason we're going to heaven. That Jesus is the reason for our life. As we look at the Scripture, we see as it continues on down there in verse 4, it says, and into an inheritance that is imperishable. Sometimes people say, well, how can I know I'm saved? What if I do something wrong? What if I, what if I curse God? What if I deny God? It is imperishable. Imperishable means it can't die. It is uncorruptible. It can't be spoiled. And it is unfading. And it is kept by your behavior. Or does it say something different in the Scripture? What is it kept by? It's kept in heaven for you. In other words, you have nothing to do with the imperishability. God has to do. Can God keep your salvation? Yes. When He gives you a lifeline and you accept that lifeline and testify that you've accepted that lifeline and follow Jesus, first in believer's baptism, then in the Lord's Supper, and all those different things, and you continue to, to testify about Jesus Christ, you are a Christian because Jesus is the one that gave that salvation to you. And your salvation is not based upon your performance. Your salvation is based upon the finished work of Jesus Christ. And in verse 5 it says, You are being protected for, by God's power, and by God's power through faith for a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Faith is a matter of believing what you do and saying, I know I don't look like a Christian. I know I don't act like a Christian. I know I've gone away from God. But... God holds on to me. Faith means that you believe. You rejoice in this, though now for a short time you have to struggle in various trials. If I was to ask you this morning, since you've become a Christian, if you had some trials, if you've gone through some difficulties and you've wondered, why is God allowing this to happen to me? I'm glad you're here this morning because this Scripture talks to us. So that the genuineness of your faith is more valuable than gold. I can take my ring. My wife gave me this. And she says that's got gold on it. I can take this gold and they'll take it and go down and they'll scratch off some. And then they'll take it and put it in the fire. And they'll look to see how many impurities in there. And if, after the impurities boil to the top, they'll look to see if anything remains in that sample. And there's gold there. Gold will remain. And it's pure. Because the impurities will come out. If it's not gold, nothing will remain. And that's how God tests us. To see if we're genuine, he says in verse 6 there. You rejoice in this, though for a short time you had to be distressed by various trials. So, 
The genuineness of your faith, more valuable than gold, which perishes through the fire, refined by the fire, may result in the praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. When is it going to be revealed? It's going to be revealed when you die and you stand before Jesus Christ and He says, come on in. And when your friend stands before Jesus Christ and He says, depart from me, I never knew you. And your friend says, but I was a preacher, I was a deacon, I was a, a teacher in the church, I, I prayed every day, I read my Bible every day, I went to church faithfully, I gave my tithes and I gave my offerings. And Jesus says, depart from me, I never knew you. Religion will not take, that's the practice of your faith, religion will never take you to heaven. It is the belief in Jesus Christ and the profession, the confession according to the Bible of that. And then the beginning to walk in the steps of Jesus. That begins with believer's baptism. It continues with the Lord's Supper. And it continues with worship in the church. It continues with witnessing to other people and allowing God to speak to other people through your statements and your conviction of the Lord by sharing Scripture with them. That's how they get there. And then in verse 10 it says, Concerning the salvation, the prophets who preached about it and grace that would come to you, they searched and carefully investigated. This is the prophets of yesterday, hundreds of years before Jesus Christ would come. They talked about it. They inquired into the time of the circumstances that the Spirit of Christ within them would indicate. That, but they were just testifying. They didn't get to see it. And he testified in advance to the messianic sufferings it talked about in the hundreds of years before Christ would come, that he would suffer, that he would go to the cross. They talked about the messianic suffering and the glories that would follow. Can you imagine, just imagine with me that you're Peter and you're here one day and Jesus Christ is, is walking and talking with you. They come and capture Jesus Christ and they take him away and they take and beat him and tr- try him. And you're wondering, what's happening to Jesus? I, I, I had all my trust in Him. And then they hang Jesus Christ on the cross. You're so scared you won't even go to the crucifixion. You're hiding. Can you imagine how you would feel? And then He comes back. And He reveals to you that He was there concerning the salvation. The prophets, they wrestled with it. They prophesied about it. In 11, they acquired what time the circumstances were going to be. And in verse 12, it was revealed to them they were not serving themselves, but serving things that you now have. The Old Testament prophets, they talked about what now the New Testament prophet of people were seeing. Peter saw Jesus raised from the dead. Peter saw Jesus say, touch my side. Peter saw Jesus eat fish and, and eat with them and appear with them and talk with them and preach and, and touch him and walk with him and saw him do things that they couldn't believe and knew that he was alive after he was dead. Peter now had an understanding. And he went out and he preached with that kind of conviction. And people gave their lives to Jesus. You ever wondered why you've never led anybody to the Lord Jesus Christ? Could it be that you've never had the conviction of your sin and that your life would end here on earth? Hell would be your destination. Have you ever come to that conviction and said, Lord Jesus, I don't deserve heaven I know I've been religious. I've done all the right things. But Lord, in my heart of hearts, I can tell by my life that I've never come to the point to believe. And I do believe that You're Jesus Christ. I do believe that You died for my sins. I do believe that that's every single thing that's necessary. That I have been given life, not because I was predestined by being in a group, I have been given life because I chose to receive you and to confess it before men. And my salvation, the lifeline that was given to me, is eternity. Forever I'm safe. The second thing is, it's not only a lifeline that's given to us, but it needs to become a lifestyle. It needs to become a lifestyle. We have a lot of people that are confused about lifestyles today. 
We're confused about lifestyles and and it's amazing to me. I, I could go into lots of things, but I don't have time. But there's a lifestyle that when you become a Christian, it becomes a key part of your life. It's a, it's a new life. It's not just what you do in church on Sunday. It's not just the fact that you come back on Wednesday. It's not the fact that you're here for life groups during the week. It's not the fact that you take and read your Bible in the morning or in the evening as a Bible study. The lifestyle is all of those things combined. People look at you and say, you are different. They might even say you're weird. And you just smile when they do and say, yeah, I know it. <laughs> I'm a Christian. I'm this way intentionally. I gave my life back on, and you point back to the time you did it. I gave my life to Jesus, and I walked up in front of a church, in front of people that I knew would not laugh at me. I walked up in front of a church, and I said to the preacher, I gave my life to Jesus on this date. Maybe it was even today. And the preacher says, that's great. What do you want to do about it? He says, I'm going to follow Jesus, whatever he tells me to do. Show me in the Bible what's next, and I want to do it. And the preacher says, well, Jesus, the first thing he did when he started his ministry was he would get, he got water baptized. Now, is there anybody in here that thinks that water baptism is the way you get saved? Well, it's funny to me why Jesus got baptized. He is salvation. He didn't get baptized to get saved. If you're pointing back at the day you got baptized, you're in sad shape. I could get, be baptized today, be baptized next week. I could be baptized 17 more times, and I would only have one salvation experience, and that is when I was age 12, I gave my life to Jesus. I knew who He was, and I knew I was going to hell. In fact, that's a very statement I made. I was sitting about where you are, Alex. I came down the front of the church there in Montgomery, Alabama, and told John Bob Riddle, my pastor, I said to him, I don't want to go to hell. He said, what do you mean? I said, I know Jesus doesn't live in me. And he shared with me how I could do that. And I prayed and invited Jesus in my life. And that's when I was saved. I didn't get baptized at that time, by the way. I was too young, they told me, to get baptized. My mother said, you can't get baptized. You're not old enough to understand what you're talking about. And I said, that's all right, Mom. Getting baptized, I understood. I was taught. I understood baptism was not when I got saved. I understood that it was when I gave my life to Jesus. And I said, that's all right, Mom. I don't need to follow Jesus and believers' baptism right now. I can do that later, as 12 years old. After six months of living a life that changed, my mom said to me, I want to go to your church and find out what it is they're teaching you because I want to have it myself. You've changed, son. And I was baptized at the same time my mother was after she gave her life to Jesus. It's a lifestyle, my friend. If you have to manufacture Christianity in your life, something's wrong because it comes that way. It's just natural that way. One of the members of our congregation was sick this week. Several have been sick, and I've been praying and, uh, with some of you and praying for many of you. And I, I, I encouraged one that at some point in the time they'd sent me a little video. And in that video, it, it kind of showed a, about the lifestyle of Christianity. And so I just looked back, grabbed the video, and took and pasted it back to him. And I said, right now, in the midst of what you're going through, this is what you're supposed to be thinking about. And they came back and preached to me. Isn't that neat? Isn't that neat? You can tell salvation's a lifestyle in a person who can do that in the midst of suffering and pain. <laughs> Oh, the lifestyle of salvation. Look with me at the passage found in 1 John. 1 John 3. And let's look at a couple of verses there. Look at how great the Father has given us what we should be called God's children. We've become God's children. And we are. And the reason the world does not know us is that it didn't know Him either. Dear friends, we are God's children now. And what we, what we will be has not even yet been revealed we know that when He appears, we will be like Him because we will see Him as He is. And everyone who has this hope in Him purifies himself just as He is pure. There ought to be a lifestyle of purifying yourself, changing your behavior. Now, if you see me on any given day, at any given time, you just catch up with me. I want you to understand something. I won't look like this. Now, I know. Sometimes you see me, I'll be up here working, and I'll be in a Bermuda shorts and a ragged T-shirt, and I'll be out trying to sweat and all that kind of stuff. And, and I've had people tell me, Pastor, I've never imagined you like that before. 
That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is that no matter whether we sin or whether we uh, live a correct life, our salvation has been determined by the fact that we believed in Jesus Christ and trusted Him for our salvation, and He begins to work that out through our life. Are you allowing Him to do that in your life? You know, I'm reminded uh, of a manufacturing of golf balls. You ever seen a golf ball? When they first started manufacturing golf balls, they made them with a smooth cover on them. Wouldn't you think that's the way they should make them? And when they would take and hit them, they would go so far. And then they noticed that after a while, those golf balls, after they got a bunch of dings in them, they went further. And they thought, what is this? And so they took and they started manufacturing golf balls with dimples in them. You ever seen a golf ball? They put dimples in them. And you know what they found out? That because the airflow, when it goes over the dimples, actually increases the distance that the golf ball will travel. I want you to know something. God intends for you to get some dimples in your life. Some dings. He wants you to go further. He wants you to go further. God wants the best for you. And you know what? Someone rightly said, when God wants to do something wonderful, He begins with difficulty. You're having difficulty in your life. When God wants to do something wonderful in your life, He gives you difficulty. He allows difficulty to come in your life. But when God wants to do something spectacular, even miraculous, He starts with the impossibility. Let somebody tell you it's impossible. And then you turn around and say to them, Ooh, thank you. I appreciate that. Now I can't wait to see what God's going to do. And when it happens, say, Remember, I told you that God takes the impossible and turns it into miraculous? That's my God. That's the lifeline. That's the lifestyle that I live. And then closing, love is not only uh, a lifeline of salvation and, and a lifestyle of salvation, but a key aspect of salvation is found in love. 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 I want you to picture that you're on one side of the, the ravine, and in the middle is nothing but sin. It's your life. It's the things that you really are, the things that are in your head you know, I can't be a Christian because of all these different obstacles. And I want you to know it's impossible to get to where God is who is perfect. You say, I know Jesus lived a perfect life, but I can't live a perfect life. And I want you to understand that that's why Jesus went to the cross. He went to the cross to bridge. That's the reason the cross is made as it is. The bridge between where you are and where God wants you to be. God sees you on the right side of the mountain. Not the wrong side. You may still be traveling across that. As you see the picture of the, of the figure up yonder, he's not all the way across. He's not at that point that he's totally convicted. But when he becomes totally convicted that Jesus died for him and invites Jesus in his life, he comes forward in the worship service like this and says to the pastor, I've done it. I've given my life to Jesus. From now on, I'm trusting him. What do we do next? We take the scripture and say, Jesus said, be baptized and believe and confess with your mouth that you're you're saved unto salvation through me, and you will be saved, we see in Mark's Gospel. Love. Love. Love for what? That's Jesus on the right side pulling you across. Pulling you across. Love. You know, anybody can manufacture uh, brotherly love. You know, if somebody's good to me and they walk up to me and they do nice things for me and they help me and they're always there in my moments of distress, I just can't help but like them because they like me. And if they're polite to me, I want to be polite to them. But that's not the kind of love that we're discussing here in the Scripture. Look with me in uh, 1 Peter 1, verse 22. Be obedient to the truth, having purified yourself. Well, sincere love. That's agape love is the word that's translated from the Greek to word love here. The love of brothers. The love of one another, earnestly from the pure heart. I want you to understand something. I want you to look around just not at the people sitting beside you. If they're Christians, there ought to be such a love in your heart for them that you can't explain it. They may have injured you. They may have hurt you. They may have disappointed you. They may have not been there for you. But listen to me. If 
Agape love is in your heart. If Jesus has come to live in your heart, you'll have a love for them that is unbelievable and you'll want to be with them. That's what agape love is. You want to be with them. You want to do things with them. You want to help them. You want to be a part of their life. You want to pray for them. You'll be lifting them up. And you'll say, I don't understand it. They've done nothing good for me, but why do I love them? And it's because the love that's in Jesus Christ is in you and in them and it draws you together with them. And you know what? The world sees this. You know what the world says? I, I don't get it. Why, why, why are you so forgiving? Why, why is it that you, you, you can't stay away from church? Why is it that you, you just have a great... You, you desire to always be with Christians. You didn't used to be that way. What's changed about you? You say, I received a lifeline. The Scripture told me, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and I shall be saved. And I believe Jesus died for me. And I, I have a lifestyle now that's changed because I want to live for Jesus Christ. I want to be a part of it. If they come in with the guns and ask me, I'll be the first to stand up and say, I'm staying. I'm staying. Who'll stay with me? All this means is that I get to see Jesus today. Those of you that leave, I hope you choose Jesus. And I'll see you then. But if you don't, not good. And then it cultivates in the fact that Jesus says, and, and the story that I tell about that is that they came into the church like this, and when everybody left, the guards then took and laid their weapons down on the ground and says, now we can worship. We got rid of all the unbelievers. Let's worship Jesus now. Then real worship occurs when the unbelievers are not there. You know, our job is to go out and get the unbelievers and to lead them to a relationship. And when they see that difference in us, we're to tell them, it's not me, it's Jesus living in me. Here's how I came to know that. When I was age 12, I was sitting in the church service and I, and I heard the presentation of the preacher and the only thing I heard in that whole message, this is true, I still remember it. That was just a few years ago, you understand. And... I heard one thing during that service, and that is that I was going to hell. Because I knew Jesus. I didn't believe that those things. And I went forward and told the preacher, I don't want to go to hell. What do I do not to? And he shared with me that Jesus died for me on the cross and that he's alive today, and he wants to come into my life. He's offering me a lifeline. And as a result of that, my lifestyle changed. I was still a boy. I was still 12, 13, 15, 18 years old. I was still a rascal. But there was a difference in me. I had a love for the people of God that nobody could explain. I wanted to worship. I wanted to serve. That was the lifestyle. And it was bonded together because of a love for the brethren. You know, those of you that are true Christians, those of you that know the Lord Jesus Christ, I can't help but love you and want to be around you. Even you, Alex. And you know what? It just makes a difference. It makes a difference. And my life is changed by the dimension of being with people I'm going to spend eternity with. Eternity. Marie Monson was a Norwegian missionary. She went to China and served over there. And there she says that there was an occasion when they took and the Chinese came and they were going to kill them. And they were, they were in this building where they were staying protected uh, serving and and they took and locked the doors, but they knew that the Chinese army would take and come right in and kill every one of them as they'd done Christians many many times in the past. And she said, all of a sudden it got quiet. The soldiers left. She said they didn't understand it. They went outside and they looked, and there was, there was nothing there. They you couldn't understand why those soldiers that were there to kill them and to make a statement against Christianity had left. She said it was several weeks later she was in town and she saw one of the Chinese soldiers. And she said, I believe you were one of the Chinese soldiers that came out to where we were meeting that day, weren't you? And he said, yes, I was. She said, what did y'all come out there for? He said, come out to kill you. He said, why did you leave? He said, are you kidding me? We saw the soldiers all around the top of that building. They were highly armed and they had bright faces. And we knew we were no match for the soldiers that you had there protecting you. So we left out of called an intelligent decision. 
Marie would later testify that because they had the love for one another, they stood with one another. None tried to get out and be protected by the Chinese to denounce Jesus. They stayed there in bond together and expected to die for Jesus Christ. She says they never saw any angels around the top of that building protecting them. You see, angels are not for you to see. Angels are for lost people to see guarding you and protecting you. They are messengers that come out of you and out of the words that you speak and the life you live that testify to other people that something's different about you that they want. She would go on, I believe, to lead that soldier to know the Lord Jesus Christ who had come there to kill her at one point. God's Word is eternal. Preach it. Read it. Live it. Share it. And God will bless you in a measurable way. I want to take and come down to the front in just a few minutes. And when I do, praise team is going to come and they're going to lead us in a song. But I want you to understand that there are people here today who need to say, I'm getting on board with Jesus. Maybe you've been a Christian going to church. You've been a religionist. You've been taking and serving God. But you've never confessed what Jesus Christ did for you. Publicly testified about that. And you want to come this morning and start with me and just say, Preacher, I'm ready to make it complete with Jesus. I'm ready. Here's when I did it. I'm doing it today. Whatever the circumstances are, tell me how to do it. I'm willing to follow Jesus. Show me in the Bible what to do next. I'll be here waiting to talk with you. Would you come? Would you be the first to come? Bow your heads with me as you stand together. And we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. And I want to pray specifically for you. If there's someone here today that says, Preacher, God spoke to me today. Would you raise your hand? No one looking. Just raise your hand and say, God spoke to me today. I heard God speaking today. Yes. 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 Thank you. Put it back down. Yes. Yes. I see them all over the house. God spoke to me today. This was for me. God spoke to me. Lord, I thank you this morning that you're speaking to people, that your spirit is alive and well. And I pray, Lord, for each person. Now, Lord, I pray that where people are inviting you into their life and want to follow you, that they will make that public. They'll come down here and share it with me first, and then I'll help them as they later share it with the congregation. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. Bless us today in worship. In Jesus' name.